Writing about crime contains themes and subjects that some may find upsetting. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for part two of the Mike Danton story. I'm your host, Bonnie Lee, and this is Writing About Crime. Chapter 22, Frosty. As a young man, David Frost was awkward, and he didn't fit in with his peers as he attended school in Brampton, Ontario. He was kind of the bullied young kid that grew into the bully himself later on in school. And this is where he picks up this philosophy of using fear and intimidation for success, and he uses this as his own style in his coaching career, and encourages his players to do the same if they want to be successful. This is dire for a young man like Mike Jefferson, who tells of abuse in the home as he grew up. His father, Steve, drank, and problems with the law ensued. He even did a stint behind bars for a small-time drug deal. And he was said to hit Sue in claims that Mike made later in interviews, saying he would try to get in between them, and then he would get the hits. He says... There was all kinds of abuse in the home, and when he's awkwardly asked if there was any sexual abuse, he repeats, abuse on all levels. In the interview, he refers to his mother as Sue and his father as Steve. But when Mike was introduced to David Frost in 1990, he was only 10 years old, and yet he began to admire David Frost, and he took an immediate liking to him. I hate my situation at home and it was someone who was just real just like kind of cool and relaxed and uh, someone that I looked up to, hockey coach. This feels a bit unsettling as you hear more about what happens behind the scenes with David Frost and other young men. Early on, it seems that Steve acquiesced to David's intimidating bravado because he sees him as more of an alpha type than he is and he appreciates that David is very switched on to hockey. And he can tell that Frost sees the promise that Mike has on the ice. And that would be powerful for Mike to see happening as a youth, because his own dominating father is taking a back seat to this man who Mike feels dominated by. And yet, he seems to gain respect and personal interest from this older man that he didn't feel he received from his father. Steve would have proved to be too concerned because he's brought into the fold as a confidant to David and he feels like the sun is shining on him as he's a behind the scenes coach while David talks to him on the phone late into the evening and they begin to hang out and become close friends. Once he gets Mike playing for his peewee level team, the Young Nationals or the Nats, Mike is in a difficult position. He's losing some respect for his father as the intimidator, and he's beginning to see David as more of a father figure. It's not highly unusual for these things to happen in life as young men are developing and navigating their way in the world. But what makes it a real knock in the head mentally is that David is not what he seems to either one of them. When Steve is confiding details about his home life and really gabbing away, especially while drinking, David is collecting a sort of intel that he can use when he's around Mike. He's a great friend and listener to Steve when they're together, but when he's with Mike, it's a different story. Steve saw David as a friend that he could trust, not knowing what he was really doing. And what he was trying to do was put a rift between the father and son. He would innocently ask Mike questions about his father, knowing fully well what the answers were in a way making Mike feel that he's confessing about his home life, or worse, telling on him. Then Frost would encourage Mike to never be like his dad, saying things to undermine Steve in Mike's mind, but he's serving it as a responsible elder's advice. Really, he was just shaming Steve to Mike's young ears so that the respect was worn even thinner and the divide would grow naturally. Why does your dad drink so much? You don't want to be a drunk like your dad, do you? You don't want to end up in jail. Why was your dad in jail? Don't end up like that. On one occasion, Mike had a less than stellar game. So David advised Steve to really rip into Mike about it so that he would learn his lesson. 
even instructing him what to say. Then later, would ask Mike if his asshole father gave him hell about his game and what a jerk he was riding him so hard. To Mike, this would be very powerful. Almost like his father was such a predictable piece of shit and David knew it without Mike even telling him. He was orchestrating the divide. And the only one that kind of had a weird feeling about it was Sue, Mike's mom. She always had a bad feeling about David Frost. But Steve was enchanted with the idea that Mike was being preened for success. And this man was a ticket to Mike's NHL career. And he was in denial to put it together when Sue spoke of it. But it was there. Once after a party, they were play fighting in the living room. And Sue was playing around and accidentally pushed Steve and his chair toppled over. They laughed about it as Sue declared herself the champ. It was a funny story and they would joke about it. But David played this to Mike as violence in the home. And he characterized it that way. Goofy play fights were perfect ammunition for someone who's manipulating people like David Frost. And over time, I feel that on a young child, that clearly idolized David and is breaking his ass to please him as a coach on the ice and his father figure off the ice. This could honestly skew Mike's own recall of all of the life events that happen between him and his parents. David Frost has got Mike. He's the alternate captain, and his closest friend Sheldon Keefe is the captain playing for the Nats. And he's working on Sheldon's family as well. He's trying to isolate him from his family in the background of it all. Then finally, in 1996, David Frost is suspended from the GTHL after the success of winning in that year's championship. The allegations were that he forged the club general manager's signature and released a player from his contract with the Nats team. For what purpose would he do that? It's a bit complicated, but the short version is so that the player who he was choosing would be released from their contract with the organization and he could later take him along to the Deseranos to form the Quinte Hawks. He claimed he didn't falsify the signature of the general manager, only that he thought he did have signing authority as a coach, so he wrote his name on the line, releasing a player that made his own request to exit from the team. He rents an apartment at the Bayview Inn and has three players living there with him in the two-bedroom suite. The Hawk, while successful, are a shit show under Frost. Reports during the first year involved multiple visits to the home rink by police. Bottles being thrown, players fighting in the hallways between change rooms, Frost players inciting fights on the ice before the refs are even out to start the game. They were popular because they were winning games, but it was success by intimidation and brute force. And Frost would take it too far during a playoff game where he was displeased with one of his roommate players, Daryl Tyburn, and in public view of the fans knocked him out with a punch to the jaw. Frost was charged later for the assault, but his charges were cut to a misdemeanor charge after each member of the team indicated that they wouldn't be ready to testify that David had punched anyone. Frost pleaded guilty to the lesser charge, and in the words of Steve Simmons, author of The Lost Dream, the entire team was willing to lie to the police for their coach. Frost paid a $250 fine for grabbing and pointing at the player, and he avoided a criminal charge. He was suspended from the team, and his Brampton players basically shut down and coasted their way through the rest of the season and out of the playoffs, right in solidarity to their asshole coach. But the rumblings were beginning now. Stories about crazy drinking parties for the players at the Bayview Inn suite were coming in. It was rumored that David would have young players in their underwear massaging him on the team bus. And stories of Frost having control over his core group of players, not only on the ice, but in their personal and family lives. In an unsettling account, it was said that David Frost was making a campaign of himself to secure a coaching position with the Ontario Hockey League or the OHL. In the meantime, 
Mike was billeted to a home in Sarnia as a prospective player with the Sarnia Sting team. Billet families take in prospective players and they provide a home environment for them as they play hockey in a city away from their home. Yet, Bonnie Gardner was not impressed by the fact that Mike had David Frost over a lot and they would visit alone in Mike's bedroom rather than in the communal parts of the home. In fact, she was so uneasy that she alerted the management staff to the behind the closed door visits. The Sting team were aware of Frost already because he was back in his usual suffocating behavior around Mike. The team's owner didn't like him and his cult-like attraction to his player, and they held an inquiry into the situation, fearing a possible abuse scenario. In the end, the team just settled on releasing Mike from the team, but it left Bonnie Gardner feeling concerned she didn't get a good feeling from Frost being around Mike. That uncomfortable, questioning feeling had impacted more than just Mike's billet family. Detective Chris Benson recalled once having Frost accompany Mike to the Peel Region Police Department. He was there to report that there was verbal abuse and drug use in his home. And when the detective became concerned about some of the details and told Mike that he was going to take his report and investigate the situation, Everything seemed fine. However, when he made a point of telling Mike that the accusations needed to be true, if they were false, he could be in trouble because this was a very serious matter. Mike became upset and told him that he just wanted his complaint on the record, but he didn't want anyone to do anything about it. It seemed very strange to Chris Benson, and he was suspicious of David Frost's motive for being involved. Frost as a coach was done, but his manipulations were in full swing. By the next hockey season, he managed to work his abilities of persuasion to have his four favorites, later nicknamed the Brampton Boys, brought on to play for the Toronto St. Michael's Majors franchise, one by one. Ryan Barnes, Sean Colton, Sheldon Keefe, and Mike, then named Jefferson. David Frost has no position with the team, but he's such a pain in the ass that all four are traded to the Barry Colts, just so the team can cut ties with any players that seem almost under the control of David Frost. Even though they were the strongest players on the team, and the team was struggling to perform. The four were successful playing with the Colts, but they played goofy hockey. Ryan Barnes is suspended for 25 games for stick swinging, Sean Colton is suspended for 15 games for initiating a fight. Sheldon Keefe refuses to shake the OHL commissioner's hand during a presentation of the J. Ross Robertson Cup. Even more scandalous because he's the team captain at the time. The four players all walked out of a banquet held for the 2000 Memorial Cup and refused to shake the commissioner's hand at the ceremonial face-off. And then after that, all the players refused to stand for the national anthem. In all of this story, and I mean so far all of it, Mike's conspiracy to commit the murder, and David Frost's control of his players, and his even more ambitious plan to manipulate and control their families, and even people in the world of hockey, and his especially Sven Galli-like control of Mike, there is the biggest bomb. Everyone around Mike, especially in hindsight, eventually admits that they saw elements of something concerning and that they either looked away and disassociated or they tried to bring things to light, but nobody really listened to them or were unwilling to act. One person, however, that was close to all of it, saw it all in its full spectrum. Everything from the manipulation of Steve and Sue to the depth of Frost's control over his players his meanness, and even the one thing everyone kind of felt, but were uneasy to permit themselves to leap to. And I know you have probably thought it already too. Tom saw it all. Even though Mike pulled away from his family years before, and in effect, he virtually abandoned his younger brother. Things happened that summer 
when Tom went with David Frost and Mike with a bunch of the crew to Frost's cabin when he was 13 years old. When he returned, he was never the same person. It broke him. His mother's concern about him going with the other crowd was based on worry that honestly was best case scenario. Her apprehension that he may be exposed to drinking and cussing and roughhousing that was inappropriate for a boy of his age was far underestimating. David Frost was obvious about his ambition to develop young men into successful professional players, but he didn't hide his over-the-top tactics to gather strong players, isolate them, and control them, and then beat down anyone impeding their journey to get to the big leagues by any means necessary. He didn't even try to obscure his violent measures to keep his players on the winning side of the game, and when he wanted to move around from team or city, he would lie, bully, and even straight up fake signatures to get them where he wanted them. Especially Mike. He had a special place for Mike Jefferson in his life. And Mike couldn't breathe in without finding David Frost at the moment of exhale. It just makes you wonder about sex stuff. Not only with Mike, what about with the ones that he had living with him at 22 Bayview? What did he have on all of these boys if he was abusing them? What would make them stick together in such a strong allegiance to protect him? I mean, if he was abusing them in any way. Wouldn't they see situations like his dismissal from the Hawks as an opportunity to free themselves from this guy? Instead, they band together to protect him from the accusations that he punched Tyvern. And then, when he's let go, they just stop performing in protest. Like they want him back, not gone. It just doesn't make sense. Unless you were at the lake with Tom Jefferson in the summer of 2000. To see what a convoluted mess was really going on. Last chapter, I told you about the invite extended to Tom Jefferson, Mike's younger brother, to join him and the gang out at David Frost's cabin. This was during the summer before Mike kicks off his first year with the New Jersey Devils. And if you recall, their mother Sue had reservations. But fellow hockey player Larry Barron was staying with the family at the time, and he encouraged her to allow Tom to join in on the holiday. He assured her that even though he was only 13, he would be safe out there with Mike and the guys, and it may even be good for him and Mike to bond. Sue agreed, and Tom was enthusiastic about connecting with Mike again while doing some fishing and boating. It was a disaster. With all of the guys already initiated into the fold with Frost, they were prepared for whatever was going to be going on during the days at the cabin. But Tom had no idea, and he was only 13. He was subjected to what seemed almost like a college hazing weekend, and Mike didn't seem to jump in to protect him from any of it. Situations like Tom having some ice cream without asking first ended up with David swearing and twisting his arm behind his back like a wrestling move while he told him that he was going to teach him some manners. Later, in front of the television, Frost called out Tom in front of the entire group and began digging into him about his parents, chastising him, and chastising them for being drunks or repeatedly beating on him. When Tom tried to clarify that the situation at home was nowhere near so dire, Frost lost his temper, yelling at the boy that his parents were fucking drunk losers and reminding him not to talk back to him. Tom was on his own, not one person, including his own brother, stepped in to tell Frost to back off. So Tom just sat quietly, trying to let Frost run out of gas. But he was a bright kid, and he saw immediately that this was how Frost worked with these guys. He would tear down their confidence and intimidate them while repeating things he wanted them to agree with over and over. And with time, they would do just as Tom did and quietly agree. Just so he would back off. Then, once things cooled, the boys would again engage with Tom and sort of encourage him to become one of us, even telling him that he should get out of his living arrangement with his parents 
and taking it further to tell him he could go with them. And then they continued to tear him down, calling him a brat and a troublemaker. The few times he was able to talk to Mike, he did ask about why he had just left the family. And Mike simply told him that his parents were no good and that Tom should get away from them too. Other terrifying incidents were described in Steve Simmons' book, such as Tom grabbing some French toast that David's wife had prepared for everyone without waiting for everyone else to eat first. He was a kid he didn't know, and Frost flew into a rage and spit on his meal and then yelled at him to eat it. When Tom refused, David slammed his head into the plate and cursed at him. After everyone continued on, Tom went to use the washroom, and when he returned, Frost was raging. He was freaking out that Tom took the food and then didn't eat it, so he lifted him off the ground with his arms pressed behind him and rammed him into the kitchen wall, and he yelled at him for not finishing his meal and talking back. Tom begged Mike to intercept, but he sat there quietly as Frost sent Tom back to the bedroom and threatened to beat him if he came out again. You did hear that, right? David Frost's wife was there. She made the meal and then didn't intervene either. Other sickening things happen, like Frost making Tom climb a tree and hang on while he shot at him with a pellet gun until he just had to let go and fall into the water. Frost was encouraging everyone to keep making Tom drink beer until he finally threw up. Frost had them undress him and put him in the shower, and when he woke... He had drawings all over him and found that they'd pushed Q-tips dipped in icy cold up his rectum. And he was terrified because he had no memory of what happened to him. And he had reason to worry. Another evening, David Frost was hanging out with the boys again and started in on Tom about having a small dick like his brother. He ended up pulling Tommy over to him and reaching into his shorts and feeling his penis and then he started telling Sheldon Keefe to show Tom his penis because it was pretty big. Sheldon did, and he stood there with his penis hanging out of his pants until Frost told him that it was fine to cover up again. He was holding on to Tommy the entire time and in front of the group of people that included females, which was a particular humiliation for a young boy. Bridget, Frost's wife, had kind of kept away. Tom noticed that she would do that, the one time that he heard her speak out to stop behaving out of line, Frost snapped at her to go stick her tit in one of the other players' mouths again. It just progressed and degraded as time went on. Every evening held a new torture for the boy. On one night, the boys, all teasing Tom, told him to take off his clothes and dance on a pool table, and they laughed at him while Frost held a rifle at him, laughing. Tom had to take his clothes off in fear, and when he was too frightened to dance, Frost sent him to his room and told him to stay there for the night. Frost was merciless for the rest of the visit. He would force Tom to go into rooms where players were having sex with their girlfriends and tell Tom to finish for them. Of course, the young boy would just stand there terrified, and then he would be berated by Frost and sent away, only to wait for further humiliations. And then, only to have his heart broken at the end of the week to find that Frost had told his parents that Tom was having such a great time that he wanted to stay for another week. His mother agreed excitedly, believing that Tom and his brother were out creating memories and Tom was being involved in Mike's life and accepted by the guys. That wasn't what was happening. In fact, there was a crushing event still waiting to happen. They said it was initiation, right? Right. And, and what were the photos? I've never seen them, but I'm told they're, they're Tom um, taped naked to a bed. Uh, and, and there's some other photos of the things that they were doing to him um, that weekend. He, he, had, he told me this was initiation and there were 15 to 20 people in the room. He had stripped me down and duct taped me naked to a bed uh, with a rifle in hand, a pellet rifle in hand. told me that if I didn't do it, then... I'd have to stay in the room, he'd lock me in there. I don't know what the story was, but... Uh, he basically told me that I have a couple minutes to rip out of it, and if I don't, he's gonna tape me up more. So he shut the lights off, and there were people... It was a huge stretch bedroom with uh, big cedar bunk beds, at least nine of them. And uh, 
he had told me that I need to rip out of these things or else he's going to take me back up. And lights went out, cameras were flashing. Uh, I couldn't rip out of it. I managed to rip somewhat out of it. He turned the lights back on, take me back up again. And uh, after a period of time, I managed to get myself out of it. But then I was, uh, I was just talked down upon the whole night and told to stay in the bedroom. You're a kid, man. I was locked in the bedroom plenty of times. I just told to go to bed and shut up. Don't say anything. You have no say. You know, there's plenty of plenty of situations that absolutely degraded me. And uh, and he claimed they claim initiation. Yeah. He was also told at that age and at that juncture to walk in on um, two 20 year olds or thereabouts having sex and Jump. take o and take over the act from from one of the guys doing it. And how old are you then? I was 13. And I was also, he, he, he demanded some girl to strip down butt naked and ordered me to go ahead and take that on. And uh, at that age, I, was, I wasn't into it, right? I just was shy, I, was, I just didn't. Were you terrified? Yeah, I, I didn't know what to expect. Like, here's this old man pointing a rifle at me, directing me to do everything in his sick little mind that he just wanted to see done. Like, I, I couldn't... Every time something like that happened, I would wonder where the hell is my brother? You know, I came here to be with him. Why isn't he here to be there for me? When Tom finally returned home, he tried to isolate himself as much as possible refusing to discuss the time away and only eating alone in his room. Finally, his mother's constant pleading wore him down and he confided in her what happened during his lake visit. Tom was angry and he wanted to see Frost arrested. He told his mother that he wasn't too afraid to tell the police, but soon knew that without proof of any kind, there was no way David Frost would be held accountable especially on the word of a 13-year-old boy. And she knew what David Frost was like, keeping the boys so tightly bound. Reportedly, Frost had done the same things with Sheldon and his family in terms of isolating them from Sheldon and having Sheldon talk with him on the phone so much that it gave other players and staff the creeps. Coaching staff became disenchanted with Sheldon only because they have to deal with Frost constantly questioning every decision they have regarding what line he plays and how many shifts he has on the ice. He's witnessed playing the same mind games, giving Sheldon a hard time, sending him away, looking almost on the verge of tears. And then he's witnessed back and forth on the phone for days before he's allowed back into the fold. It seems like many of the things that we talked about in Mike's chapter could just have easily been Sheldon's chapter. He went on to play NHL hockey, but he had the same aversion as Mike did, adjusting and working his game with the farm teams. He wanted to jump from dishwasher to CEO at Frost Encouragement, and who knows how much it cost him. If you recall, Mike goes on to play with the Devils. Everything that ensued there was an okay couple of years. And when all that ended with him giving up on his agent, Mike Gillis, David Frost was right there, a newly minted NHL player agent. He was Mike's new agent, and he had his talents hooked right in. Mike is ready to disconnect from his family completely, and the gun is cocked in 2001, when Sheldon Keefe's mother was cleaning her home and discovered some photos they were taken during a holiday that Sheldon had out at David Frost's cabin the previous summer. Photos of Tom were included in the collection. Her good judgment told her and her husband Brian that they had an obligation to come forward. The photos were shared with Dr. Brian Shaw of the NHL Players Association, and from there, the Children's Aid Society. The professionals were bound to involve the police. And as investigation was initiated, Frost and his players were switched on to the fact that these photos had been turned in. That causes so much tension for Sheldon and his family. 
and the Keefs want so badly to preserve their relationship with their son Sheldon that they agree to his demand that they stay away from the Jeffersons and stop meddling in his private affairs. David continues in the background, repeating whispers that Steve is contacting him for some more of Mike's money, further estranging him from the Jeffersons too. I don't want my name to be associated with, uh, with him, with her, with uh, anybody in that side of the family. The investigation continues into the photos that were discovered at the Keefe's home on the weekend of Frost's visit to the cabin. At one point, Sue tells of a sickening moment when she encounters a fellow who is best friends with Frost's wife's brother. He tells her that he is sorry after hearing about Mike being the father of Bridget's baby. He tells her the whole family is upset and devastated. Sue was in shock and didn't know what to believe. She did tell author Steve Simmons that the police during the investigation told her that it was true. It pulled her into the vortex of sadness and eventually depression that she continued to struggle with for a long time. And it laid heavily on her that she had a grandchild that even Mike doesn't acknowledge. Neither David Frost, his wife Bridget, or Mike Danton have ever publicly commented. By now, Mike is a St. Louis Blue. And if you recall, he tried to hire someone named Ronnie, a bouncer he thought was a hitman, to take care of David Frost. When it doesn't pan out, he calls him back and he sounds desperate to figure out when it can be done. Hey, Ronnie, it's uh, Mike Collins. If you uh, can't do this, you know, let me know so I can try and find another way to do this because uh, this is getting real serious. He's still at my place tonight and tomorrow night um, by himself. All right, I'll try and get to next time. So, as a quick review, Katie gets Justin Levi Jones, the police dispatcher, to arrange a conspiracy to kill David Frost for Mike Danton. This happens while David Frost is living and staying with Mike in his St. Louis apartment. And Danton keeps saying that the target is there for the next few days, and so things need to happen. Yet, he tells Katie that someone is coming from Canada and that he thinks that they're going to hurt him. By April 15th, 2005, Mike is in San Jose to play game five and he's expecting the hit to happen that night. David Frost sees Levi and Katie and they speed away. He tries to convince the police that he's Steve at first and then he can't convince them that he's not a Canadian hitman. The FBI had been listening into the calls that Mike was making to Levi as he was freaking out to find out what happened or didn't happen. Next, Frost is being questioned and they let him call Mike where he hears Frost and he bursts out crying that he didn't try to kill him. So I sit down and he goes, I think your buddy there might be a bad guy. And I'm like, my buddy? My, my buddy who? And he goes, well, I think the hockey player might have been trying to kill you. I get on the phone. I say to Mike, it's got this FBI guy here. And he's telling me he thinks you maybe tried to kill me. Mike bursts out like crying. He goes, no, I didn't try and kill you. So this whole rigmarole goes on. Dave, I'm up. My head's not right. I'm not thinking right. I'm not thinking straight. I don't want to live. This is crazy. I can't deal with hockey. Hey, Nick, yeah. Listen, do I have to worry about my safety anymore? No, I don't. Mike Danton later insists that he intended to kill Steve Jefferson, but it's not very convincing. Who did you try to kill? Um... Steve Jefferson. Your father. Yeah. At that time, it had been years since you had spoken to Steve Jefferson or had any contact with him. So it's natural for people to say, why would you think he would show up in your apartment? Why would he have a key? Why would he even know where you lived? 
I'm just not going to discuss it. That's one of the things that uh, I've maintained the whole time. I'm just not, uh, I'm not prepared to, uh, to talk about right now. By the next day, Mike is arrested in San Jose, the day after the St. Louis team is eliminated from the Stanley Cup playoffs. By the 22nd, Mike and Katie are both indicted, and Mike is charged on a conspiracy to commit murder. He was only 23 years old and had 90 NHL games under his belt. By early May, Mike pleads not guilty to charges of conspiracy to commit murder and using a telephone across state lines to attempt the murder. His mother, Sue, and his brother, Tom, as well as his Aunt Linda were there in court to support him, along with Scott Mellenby and Doug Waite, two teammates from the St. Louis Blues. Federal authorities claim that Mike wanted Frost murdered after an argument on April 13th. They believe he fought about Mike's promiscuity and alcohol use, and they proposed that Mike had Katie help them orchestrate and hire a man believed to be a hitman for $10,000 to kill Frost while Mike was away in San Jose for the playoffs. On May 21st, a bail hearing is held, and Assistant U.S. Attorney Stephen Clark is brutal. He says Mike Danton was too cowardly to kill David Frost himself, and instead he used his teenager fan and occasional lover to help him arrange the murder. He alleged that Mike was fearful of Frost's intention to go to the St. Louis Blues Association and provide them with information that would ruin his career. He asserted that Mike would be a flight risk specifically because he only has ties to St. Louis with his contract with the Hockey Association. His contract was resolved in under one month. Once that happened, as a Canadian citizen, Mike could return to Canada through an open border. He stated Mike must be aware that with these and other potential charges coming that his hockey career was likely over. The evidence was so overwhelming that considering any acquittal would be almost unthinkable. He also argued that Mike Danton would be likely to attempt to have Frost murdered again, depending on how the relationship goes, claiming that there's an ebb and flow aspect to their association. Mike's lawyer, Bob Haar, argued that the tape played from Mike Danton and David's conversations showed that Mike was emotionally tortured and needed psychological help that he wouldn't receive in a prison setting. He points out Mike's comments that he can't go on like this anymore and that he feels sick in the head. Hello? Hello, this is a collect call from... Mike. An inmate at the Santa Clara County charges press zero to refuse. This call is subject to monitoring and recording. Thank you for using Evercom. This all sucks. I'm sorry. This place where I am now sucks. Did you tell the lawyer that? I don't tell them. Oh, they're on their way. They're, they're coming like, wait, I thought you were calling me because they left. No. Okay. You upset? Yeah. I talked to you guys, I just woke up. Party? Just woke up. Okay, well tell me, what's the matter? I got moved because why they're hustling me lots of money is because I had to move out. So I had to put all my shit together. Okay. Remember something, okay? Yeah. This isn't going to last long. We're going we're gonna to do what we said we're going to do. We're going to get you into the counseling and that changes everything. The whole setting, I found out everything about it. It's like your own little, like you get like in a, a room, but it's not a jail, so it's an apartment type thing. And you have to have your own stuff. We've got to give you your own stuff. You just got to go to counseling every day. You have computers, you have access. I mean, obviously, it's not wide because you're, you're under counseling, so you're not gonna, you can't like go on a porno site or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> I was never on a porno site. <laughs> I know you were. What I'm saying, well, you didn't need to be a porno going on your own house. Mm -hmm. um, they're subpoenaing me into court for Thursday, 9.30. Right. So I have to testify before the grand jury. And all that is, is they, they'll show the grand jury they have wiretaps on you. And because I was at the apartment, they're going to try and say I was the victim, and I'm going to say the same thing I said that night. Right. And then it's going to be, I mean, they have enough to indict you, but trust me, because they indicted the girl and fuck all. Right. What will happen is at some point, what happened to her will happen to you you will go for a bond hearing. And that's usually like a day later after they uh, 
they'll formally charge you with this shit. Right. So what will happen is you can talk to these knuckleheads about this when they come in and just say to them, how is this going to work? Like, say, if I'm back on, say, say to them, say, if I'm back on Thursday, when will I have the hearing to allow me to get into counseling? Mm -hmm. Repeat to them counseling five, six times. It's good for a lot of reasons. First of all, you send your point home. Right. Second of all, you show the remorse that you need it. Third of all, you get the fuck out of these jail cells. Yeah. Okay? And I know this sucks, Mike. So what we're guessing is Thursday. <laughs> okay? What day is it today? Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. All right, hang in for me, okay? I know it sucks. You know that? I have fucking eat today. I have two pieces of bread. Okay, listen, listen. That's the kind of shit I want you to tell this guy. And I want you to talk about that right off the hop. I told that fucking guy to bring you McDonald's. He said they might not let, you, they might not let him bring it into you. Mm -hmm. um, I said, bring him McDonald's for your meeting so he can fucking eat. I'm really mad about that. So you make sure if Frank's there, mm -hmm. talk to Frank about that. Say, say, Frank, is there anything you can do? I have an attorney here? Okay. Oh, my God, my attorney. Okay, that, that's them. Okay, I want you to pay attention to me, okay? Yeah. Be calm, mm -hmm. cool, mm -hmm. collective, mm -hmm. but you talk about your fears. All right. Okay? Yeah. I want you to know how much I care about you, how much I love you, and no matter what happens, you're going to get through this. You're still going to be a young man when this is done. Right. You're going to have a lot ahead of you. Okay, I so don't want you to... This is all father talk. I'm sorry? Fears of father. That's right. Okay. Okay? All right. And, and fears of everything. You've had all kinds of issues. Okay. Just be calm. Don't talk quickly. Talk quietly. Or talk calmly. You know, if, 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 you, know might, you might have a breakdown. Mm -hmm. If you do, that's fine. You know, I'm not telling you to do it. Okay, I gotta go. Okay? All right. Listen, yeah. I am behind you. I know. We all are. Okay, okay I love you, kid. Love you, too. Bye. Bye. Clark argued that all of his comments demonstrated that Mike was remorseful for getting caught and that his reaction was a natural response for those that are guilty, calling his plan for release and treatment bogus. On July 1st, the St. Louis Blues release Mike Danton from his contract. And by mid-July, Mike enters a guilty plea in an East St. Louis court for the federal conspiracy charge. His lawyer expresses to the media that this is the best way to limit the amount of time that the young man would lose in his life. David Frost staunchly denied being the target when he was contacted by the media, telling them that he was there out of concern about Mike's use of painkillers and sleeping pills. Held in consideration was recordings that were secretly recorded between Katie and Justin Jones about paying him $10,000 to commit the murder on Mike's behalf. A few weeks into serving his sentence, Mike Danton tried to commit suicide in his cell, wrapping his cut-up towel around his neck and jumping from his bunk. Fortunately, he survived the attempt when the towel couldn't hold his weight, and he later said that he 100% wanted to die, but once he survived, he knew he was meant to live. In 2005, Mike Danton begins his petition to serve the remainder of his sentence in Canada. David Frost still insists that he's Mike's agent and screens all communications from Mike while he's incarcerated in a New Jersey prison. He claims he doesn't want to say much else because it could compromise Mike's transfer. He makes innuendos that when, when Mike returns home, he'll have a big story to tell, implying that there's a bombshell, claiming that, Mike will reveal a bigger story than anybody knows. When confronted about the nature of his relationship with Mike Danton, he laughs at the suggestion that his demand for Mike to repeat that he loves him is not suggestive as it seems. He says that Mike is like a son to him, and his wife too, and that he was trying to help Mike stay strong. He says that he and Mike laugh at people's question of the nature of their relationship. Mike says the same thing, rolling his eyes at the suggestion. Hey, yeah, do you want me? Yeah, say it, okay. Do you? Yeah, okay, okay, bye-bye. Shortly after an interview, David Frost is reviewed by the NHL Players Association to determine if he could keep his status as an accredited agent, and he resigns by December 6th, in 2005. Shortly after that is when Steve finds out about the photos from the trip 
and Mike claims that the hazing style photo was taken to the police by Steve and as a punishment because he wanted Mike to give him some of the money that he was given for his contract. He calls him a pitiful human being. By August 22nd of 2006, David Frost is charged by the Ontario Provincial Police with 12 counts of sexual exploitation. The charges stem from an investigation into his 1995 to 2001 conduct, which falls during his Quinte Hawks days. Steve Jefferson says, we've been waiting for this for so long. Although many, especially the Jeffersons, felt disappointed that his charges didn't include anything from the days that Tom was photographed at the cabin, it was good news to see him held accountable in some way for behaviors that many people were now becoming wise to. David's reputation was finally catching up with him. He's given bail after being charged for his sexual exploitation charges, and in the intern, he's given permission to leave Canada. He intends on attending a training camp of a player that he's prospecting so that he can review his performance in person. He argues it's necessary for work. It was wasted time, though, because the Coyotes' general manager refused to let him attend the camp or have access to staff or any players. Around this time, in 2007, Frost is charged with fraud and impersonation, as well as a breach of probation, for trying to pay for $90 in gasoline with Mike Danton's credit card. I wasn't able to obtain court documents because in Canada, it's a bit challenging. But as a compliment to the reports published in the news outlets, a lot of insight into the trial is found in Steve Simmons' book, The Lost Dream. I have credited that reference in the show notes as well as including a link if you're interested. I would encourage you to read it because it goes much further into detail than we can hear. It was a tireless and expensive journey and the Ontario police spent over two years investigating Frost and his time living with three players, one being Mike, in Suite 22 at the Bayview Inn. The case would have to prove illegality occurred when at the time Mike was only 16 years old, but the other two players were in their 20s. So the players and their girlfriends, all getting drunk and partying with Frost, the hockey coach and mentor, wasn't illegal. Even the sex, if all consensual, was distasteful, but did it break the law? Frost was considered an authority figure in the scheme of things, so the hope was to demonstrate that he used his perceived influence over their future in professional hockey to make them participate in sexual situations that were not consensual for everyone. However, the case would take years to see a courtroom. It seemed nobody in the Crown's office wanted to touch this controversial case, but eventually, successful office lawyer Sandy Say was put on the case. He had limited experience with criminal cases, but was a well-respected litigator. However, Frost was represented by quite the respected defense attorney as well, Marie Heinen. You may recall her from the Gian Gomeshi trial, a powerhouse in the courtroom who rarely loses a case. Yet, she seems less than captivated with her client. It appears David Frost's magical ability to control people is limited to young boys. Details revealed in court were not becoming of Canadian hockey as a culture. Reports of group sex, promiscuity, and polyamorous relationships were commonplace. One 16-year-old woman told the court that she had between 25 and 30 group sex encounters that involved players and even Frost himself during the Hawks era. One player even goes on to describe a three-way between him, his girlfriend, and his younger brother in an effort for his younger brother to lose his virginity. He shrugged, describing that they all agreed on it. Although the players testifying were called in as witnesses for the Crown, they weren't offering anything other than support for David Frost. They were grown men now, but at the time of the events in question, they were minors, and their identities were protected from being made public. But in a sort of disgusting legal fallout, the females that agreed to come forward and give their statements were not victims at the trial, so they were considered witnesses. So they didn't have the same laws protecting their identities from being revealed. This is a tough nut considering the players were testifying more like support witnesses for David Frost, and the girls were there to testify that 
Frost had assaulted them. It would have been different, but they were there as witnesses to attest to the conditions of the living space and what they observed happening around them. One witness told the court of being enchanted with one of the young players. She was really taken with him, and she recalled that they had sex, even though she was 16 and a virgin. And she was a compelling witness because she was sweet and believable, as a kind of innocent type who had become very taken with the star player. So her recall of her sexual encounter was more disturbing. She told of being coerced by her boyfriend to engage in a threesome, and she felt very hesitant, but agreed in the end. She assumed that it would probably be Mike Danton joining the young couple. She was disgusted to realize that 29-year-old David Frost was to join her and her 16-year-old boyfriend in the threesome. She described both of them kissing her and then in detail described the rest of the encounter. I don't feel the need to retell those here. I'll just say that it's really sad and upsetting. And to make it even more distressing, she tells of a second encounter that was just as gross as the first one. She also revealed that David would sometimes be in the room and tell couples what positions to use, and even went as far as to help place people in those positions. For being in such a vulnerable place, recounting this in a courtroom, she was very brave. Not only that, she was very believable because her emotions were on full display, and her courage to tell her story, knowing that her identity was free to be reported in the media, was very admirable. Many news outlets printing news from the trial declined to print her name out of respect for the young lady. I know these details have been disturbing, and I want to warn you, they're on the path to getting much worse. I've tried to limit the details to what's relevant to the story, while including what's necessary to demonstrate how brutal and obscene David Frost really is. It isn't for everyone to hear. Some will find it upsetting, and I want to put up that flag right now. Don't listen if it's going to hurt you. Just skip ahead to the end of this section if you feel unsettled or if you just ate dinner. The reason that I opted to include this court information is that Mike Danton's reasons for conspiring to commit murder is what this entire chapter is about, and his later claims that his target was in fact his father may or may not be true. But to see behind the curtain into Frost's conduct will inform your reasoning and help you decide what's really motivating Mike. Obviously, none of this behavior could be happening without David Frost facilitating the party suite, the alcohol, and suggesting the sexual stuff, and then taking it further by involving himself. How did this nearly 30-year-old man, who was loud, piggish, and dumpy, and unattractive, orchestrate these good times and sex parties? Coercive control, manipulation, and one other very powerful card in his deck. He was the coach, and he held influence over their success as hockey players. That was all that the Crown had to get across to the judge to make a case for sexual exploitation. So just imagine this kind of behavior going on, say, in a high school and teachers renting a suite for their underage students. It's never going to happen without a criminal conviction. One word gets to a parent or educator within earshot, and it would, the whole thing would be burned to the ground. But the ineffective Sandy C had no experience with cases similar to this and had no grasp of the culture of hockey. People, including Mike Danton's parents and brother Tom, were reeling in their seats at the opportunities lost to clarify what made David Frost's decorum so criminal. Even when former assistant captain Ian LaRock was called to the stand, he was only asked questions that would be conducive to him testifying that yes, it was normal in hockey for players to engage in threesomes and foursomes. And he had been around many teams and coming from as far away as Texas to testify. Yes, three boys would have sex with a girl. That wasn't unusual. But he wasn't there to testify about that. He was prepared to tell of the unusual conditions that these things were happening under all those years ago. What he was there to testify was that for a coach to provide a party suite and not only engage in the behavior, but to participate was not usual. And it made LaRock uncomfortable and uneasy. 
In times where things like this go on, it's usually the case that the coach doesn't even know about it, much less place them in positions and join in. Frost was said to even enjoy literally guiding the boys' penises into their partners. Ian's attorney was pissed. Every question seemed to be about his general observations in the hockey world, and not one was specific about things that he witnessed with David Frost. Ian LaRock was upset that he wasn't given the opportunity to reveal what he knew and what he had told to the Ontario police. Even court reporters were confused and a bit alarmed at the inability for the Crown to ask the right questions of the witnesses during trial. Well, fine with David Frost and his on-point and very experienced defense attorney, Marie Heinen, who was always prepared, always a step ahead, and always ready to pick up on any small detail that may be argued as proof that David was in fact not responsible for the behavior of the players that he coached. She asked all the right questions and made all the right comments for the judge to overhear. When one witness was on the stand describing how she didn't want Frost involved in the bedroom with her and her boyfriend, much less creeping in and helping them get into positions that he demanded, Heinen questioned her decision to not protest or refuse, much less to return and involve herself again. She responded that she regretted it, but that she didn't want to have a relationship with her player boyfriend be jeopardized, so she went along with it, calling herself the quiet one. If David Frost didn't approve of her, then her boyfriend's needs to have David Frost's approval would mean goodbye. Heinen suggested, and remember she's a witness, not an accuser, that she was clearly willing to do anything to have a relationship with the elite hockey player, stressing that she was the one willing to engage in all the scenarios. This confiscates the fact that the player is clearly being controlled by David Frost, even in the bedroom with his girlfriend. And Frost's intimidations were so overt that he even entered the room as he wished to control everything. This young girl had become smitten with the young player and was seeing that others seemed to acquiesce to David Frost and her boyfriend that she so admired seemed to agree to it all. Obviously, as she matured, she became aware of the boundaries that are acceptable or not, but it wasn't her questionable judgment on trial. It was the adult coach and supposed mentor. He was clearly crossing the line by involving himself in threesomes with his players. So, in case the astute judge may be inclined to that thinking, Heinen was careful to comment that, quote, We know there were threesomes with Mr. Frost, because you say so. Undermining the young woman's testimony, who was already looking like she would burst out crying at any time. Her only defense was, because I know so. But the seed was planted. And remember, beyond a reasonable doubt, the second female gave disturbing testimony as well. She described her first time with her boyfriend and Frost being involved. She acknowledged that her boyfriend seemed to be way out of his comfort zone, saying that he appeared confused about what to do and didn't even seem like himself. Ugh. Just like on the ice, he was looking to Frost to tell him what to do to execute his game so that Frost would be pleased, and it was awful. Frost mounted himself on the poor girl and made her boyfriend play with his penis, and then made him rub it on her, and eventually made him put it into her. Then after a while, he removed it and masturbated on her. Her boyfriend was so apprehensive, but Frost insisted that he have sex with her. When he was unable to maintain an erection, Frost called him a wimp and teased him for not being able to get hard even going so far as to tugging on his penis and telling him, make it hard. The witness testified that she didn't want to be there. And in an email submitted as evidence that she had told her friend that David Frost had once entered the room and demanded she sleep with him, rationalizing that she could make her boyfriend happy by letting him have sex with her. She refused. And shortly after, Frost returned with her boyfriend and they kept encouraging her. They were relentless, trying to kiss her and coerce her, but she kept pushing them away. In an email to her friend, she said, I said no, but he kept bugging me, and finally I said I don't care, so I just laid there. They both had intercourse with her and then left the room together. 
She described crying her eyes out so long that when her boyfriend returned to the room to go to sleep, she was still in tears and she didn't want to be around him. She got up to leave the room and he asked her what was wrong. And in a telling comment that characterized her situation, she responded, It doesn't matter how I feel as long as you're happy. It's not unusual for victims of sexual assault to mentally disconnect from their attack and let their mind go elsewhere as a defensive tactic to save their sanity. This poor witness described that she'd been engaged in sex acts where Frost included himself by being in the room, involving himself and on occasion having her perform oral sex on him, and she was disgusted. If you aren't throwing up already, a physician testified that David Frost had a physical irregularity. His physician had been treating him at the time for a plum-sized blood sac that was under his penis and that would resemble a third testicle. This disgusted basically everyone in the courtroom, but more disgusting was that Frost's female defense attorney pointed out that the second witness had claimed in a statement to police that Frost didn't have any distinguishing features. With multiple encounters that included oral sex, how did she not know about this apparent deformation around his genital area? Implying that the witness was lying about the encounters when in reality, she was probably just not opening her eyes or running her hands on any part of Frost's body that she didn't have to. Sandy Sue didn't ask her to explain or elaborate on her physical reasons for not scrutinizing David's unwanted, disgusting body, so it was left there like a hole in her credibility. And it was another chip out of the Crown's case to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And I'll note as well that this was not a jury trial. All of this circus is going on as an orchestration of Marie Heinen and her powerful command of the courtroom in front of a questionable sitting judge. He was seemingly sympathetic to David Frost as the trial chugged along, reportedly making gestures like laughing and winking at him even. He occasionally referred to him as Frosty during the trial. It made Sue Jefferson uneasy, and Sue's gut turned out to be a good indicator. Judge Griffin ruled that David Frost was not guilty and acquitted him of all four of the charges. He agreed that there was a case against Frost to be made, but ultimately, the Crown didn't meet the burden of beyond a reasonable doubt. He chastised the prosecution for not meeting the legal obligation to secure a conviction. And during the reading of the verdict, a girl in the gallery shouted out, Scumball, and murmured, That's for my sister. And in his usual graceful form, David Frost turned to her and said, Go fuck yourself. Sue and Steve Jefferson were not pleased with the verdict. They knew that justice for the experience Tom had at the cabin years ago was not happening. And there was some hope that Frost would see a conviction for these charges at least. And of course, Mike Jefferson was not involved in the trial. He was still serving his sentence in the United States for the failed attempted murder plot. Mike is transferred to an assessment center on March 19th in Kingston, Ontario. And he's back in Canada where corrections will decide when he can be paroled. By mid-September 2009, six months later, a 29-year-old Mike Danton appears clean-shaven in a collared dress shirt for his parole hearing. He does very little to enlighten the National Parole Board panel in terms of the motive and for his time, saying it was his father that was the real target. He describes the use of uppers and downers combined with alcohol and the pressure created a sense of paranoia to where he believed his life was in danger. Once he's released, in an interview, he says he doesn't need anybody and he sounds free. It's like he went to prison to break the shackles of David Frost and his past. He was still friendly with Frost, although Frost moved to California and launched a website to reveal the guarded secrets and playbooks to give a rookie player an insight into how to make it in the big leagues. I think it was called I Am a Hockey God, but it gets shut down. He also pens an online book called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, going up in the NHL, and it's sold online. I didn't even bother reading it. I can't comment on its performance. 
Danton is then cleared to play university hockey at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and he begins his studies to get his degree in psychology. He makes his first public statement coming straight from his classes, wearing a t-shirt and jeans. University officials were there to support Mike as the newest member of the alumni and of the Huskies hockey team. He thanked the university, the coaching staff, and the community for opening up their arms. Mike seemed focused on moving forward and studying and playing the game he loved, almost seemingly on better ground at his new place in life than he had ever been. Hi. Uh, if you don't know, I'm Mike. Um, excuse the dress code, but uh, I had class until 11.15 and I wasn't going to wear a suit to uh, sociology and psychology, so this is me in school. I learned to expect the worst and hope for the best. And um, I'm expecting, I guess, uh, any and all sorts of criticism. But when it comes down to it, um, I know how to deal with that. You know, I, I love the game. I've been removed for a few years, but that's, that's, that's where my heart is. I, I want to I wanna do something in hockey. And I think that uh, my experiences and, and my past can help with... Uh, with uh, maybe sports psychology or, or, or some degree with, uh, you know, with, with, with children that have similar backgrounds as me, um, you know, so getting a sociology degree is, is paramount in, in what I want to do after hockey. By January 27th, 2010, Mike plays his first game with the St. Mary's Huskies in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He doesn't fail to impress as he gets on the ice, showing he has the physicality and the skill set to still play great hockey. He later says... Scoring a goal was a huge monkey off my back. There was some local debate hanging over a former NHL player with a criminal record and nearing 30 playing on university level hockey. But some argued that he was setting a very positive example of someone embracing second chances and going full steam back into a sport and education to make something of himself. For anyone, including Mike Danton, it really could have gone many other ways. It became a case of people's personal attitudes and some only seeing Mike as what his past indicated or seeing Mike as a guy that wanted to get his life back together in a positive way and was out every day working towards that goal. The coaching staff at St. Mary's seemed pleased with their choice and Mike Danton paid them well for the opportunity by playing good hockey. He also achieved exemplary grades in his classes and demonstrated himself very strong academically, maintaining a near 4.0 grade point average. He went on to win the University Cup with the Huskies. By January 2011, Mike joins the pro leagues in Sweden, Austria, Slovakia, Kazakhstan, and Romania. His experiences run the gamut, but at 33, Kazakhstan was really difficult. He tells Dan Maraza of SI Sports that almost everything was difficult. There were scorpions in the dressing rooms, and the conditions living there were hard to reconcile. Even the eating habits there, with the plain food and disdain for anything chocolate or sauces or condiments, made eating terrible. And their love of eating horse meat bothered him as well recalling once finding a severed horse's leg at his doorstep, assuming someone had butchered and ate the rest of the animal. He sent his partner Nancy and their young son Tanner back to Canada. He was relieved to be given an option to play in Poland. Everything was better there. He was still continuing to work on his studies and was excited about his family and future. He said he still had his dark past creeping into his life, but Mike had good perspective, saying, I just wish people would take time to get to know me and make decisions after that. If you still think I'm the crazy psycho killer guy, that'll be your opinion. The type of person that I am today is different from 10 years ago. Mike went on to win the championship with the Polish League. Mike Danton was successful as a professional hockey player after his university career ended. He went on to grab 249 points in 239 games. Mike didn't try to hide from his past mistakes, but he didn't let them decide what his future would be either. He landed the role as an assistant coach with the Valley Wildcats in the Canadian Maritime League 
soon after ending his professional career. Mike and Nancy have three kids and are happy living in Canada. He seemed to have picked himself up after his bad experiences and done his time and moved on to become the person he was always meant to be. People started recognizing that more than just a redeemed guy, Mike Danton was becoming a real example of overcoming past mistakes and moving on in a positive way. Mike's story is very complicated and it seems abundantly clear that his target was David Frost, but he denies it to this day. His claim is that his father Steve was his intended target, but doesn't want to elaborate why. Leaving people to fill in the blanks a little bit, if they want to make sense of it at all. But you were the only person who could have been in his apartment. He didn't know I was in the apartment. But you were the only person who could have been there. Could have been. Well, I guess. Any reasonable person can look at the evidence here and, and determine for themselves that David Frost was the intended victim. And it really came down to control. It was an effort for Mike Danton to shed himself of the control that David Frost had over, over him and his life. What to make of it all is very perplexing. Mike Danton rejecting his family is really sad, specifically his younger brother, Tom. They saw each other very briefly after Mike was released from prison and after he was given a spot at the St. Mary's University. Mike was training to get back into shape before going to the East Coast and he happened to be using ice at the same time at the same complex that his brother Tom was at and their paths crossed briefly. Mike refused to speak with his brother and after Tom almost begged him to say why he wouldn't talk to him at all, the only thing he would say was, you can blame Steve for this. Tom didn't have the same hostility towards their parents. In fact, after seeing how heartsick they were after Mike changed his last name to Danton, Tom had Jefferson tattooed on his forearm, so there would be no question where he had come from. Mike might not have truly been able to keep ties with Tom while he had so much anger towards his parents, especially with David Frost having such deep claws into him. It may even explain his emotional inability to protect Tom from the abuse that he was suffering during his time at the cabin. But I would have imagined a meeting between them would have gone in the opposite direction and that there would have been some relief that his younger brother still acknowledged him in any way. Perhaps he was unwilling to because of shame. No one knows, much less Tom Jefferson, who I honestly feel has been terribly victimized. His story has affected me the most, to be honest. Jesus Christ, he was 13 years old. It seems so punitive to dismiss him so many years later. I kind of hope that they've quietly begun to repair their relationship privately, but I'm not optimistic. Mike had claimed no regrets in an earlier interview. It's weird because the mistake that everyone thinks that I would want to take back, I don't want to take back. It made me the person I am. Oddly, he seems a bit nervous or self-conscious saying it in front of the camera. And at the time, both he and Frost were still friends both speaking to documentarians about their relationship in separate interviews. I know it's presumptuous, but I had a gut reaction to that. It kind of turned the lights on for me and how I feel about everything that transpired. Although Mike Danton is the only one that truly knows, I couldn't help but read into his claims that the conviction and jail sentence was not something he would take back. He was the only one that did real jail time in the end, but it was the beginning of his emancipation. At the time, he was starting to engage more with his teammates on the St. Louis Blues, which was not something he had really done in his entire hockey career. And he started dating Katie, which may not have ended up being the love of his life, but still, imagine getting involved with a new relationship. And David Frost is holed up in your living space, controlling you and living like a jab of the hut. I mean, this repugnant reminder of everything you want to get out of your life, and it's literally blocking you from ever moving on without him. 
Mike was living with a literal succubus who had his own family to live with. But instead, he insisted on staying around being a constant physical barrier and an emotional vampire. And wasn't all of this coercion only successful on the presumption that Mike Danton had a desire to play professional hockey? I doubt that Mike even enjoyed playing hockey anymore at this point. This young man was in the throes of the Stanley Cup playoffs, and I can't help but feel that he was ready to do something beyond risky to break the chains already, because the situation was never sustainable. And when it didn't work and Frost avoided death, I honestly believe that Mike Danton had to do whatever he was going to do to get him through to the other side of his life that was never going to work. He didn't have anyone to help him once he was in American prison waiting for trial. He had to cling to Frost and to try to reverse the clock. Tell him that he was crazy, stressed, psychotic, whatever. Only within weeks of his verdict being read, he tried to commit suicide in prison. And when that didn't work, he had to figure out a way. I think he reached that apex where I can't kill Frost, I can't kill myself. He was backed into a corner of choosing his own life on his own terms. And if you look at it rationally, it's a real possibility that this was the kind of direction this tragedy was going anyway. So either live out your remaining days in a fog of depression and anxiety with no determination in your own life's path, or just keep grinding. Like Sheldon Keefe, Mike's best friend during his formative years, who also struggled to estrange himself from Frost's dark influence on his life and career. It was going to take some hard work, but it could be done. Mike Danton was never a quitter, and if you can take one thing out of his story, let it be that you don't need to shut your own lights out to find a trap door out of a life under the cloud of David Frost. If anyone knows that, it would be Mike's childhood friend Sheldon Keefe. He lived it too, and he moved on after his time in the NHL returning to Canada. There was still that David Frost association clinging to him as he was trying to establish himself in a new career and identity. You know, I knew that uh, getting into coaching or really remaining in hockey, that you know, I had a lot of my history and my background that was, was going to hold me back. Um, obviously had uh, you know, a, a great weight you know, on, on my shoulders on any chances of advancing. So again, I just really stuck to, to what I knew, which was putting a good product on the ice in Pembroke and developing young players and trying to network and, and uh, treat my players well and their families well with, you know, having ultimate confidence that eventually, you know, if you touch enough people in a positive way that uh, you know, eventually you're going to find someone to believe in you. And I was very fortunate that they did believe in me and gave me the opportunity and uh, hopefully continue to make the best of it. You know, the fact that I really wanted to have the opportunity to create an identity for myself. And uh, if that meant having to give up playing and, and get involved more in the hockey operations, coaching, where again, that. I know you would have the opportunity in doing that to really deal with people, young people and their families one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it felt strongly that'd be a, the best way for me to, one, separate myself from the past and all of the noise that was around me um, and begin to make connections and sort of bring out my true self and, and my character. Sheldon's coaching style and influence on his players proved to be an indirect opposition to what he learned from Frost. His focus on communication with his players has been the fulcrum that set his hockey career back on track. In fact, he just made his return to the NHL as a new coach for the Toronto Maple Leafs this week after coach Mike Babcock was fired in response to their recent losing streak. The Leafs have played only three games under Keith's umbrella and they have won every single one of them. The culture of hockey is changing Racism, bullying, and abuse are just not tolerated the way they once were. In fact, just this past Remembrance Day, Canadian commentator Don Cherry was removed from his spot in the historic hockey night in Canada for calling out what he termed these people for coming to Canada and not supporting war veterans by wearing a poppy. Comments seemed less incensed at the issue of calling out the public for not wearing a poppy. They were more repelled by his terminology. 
Instead of the broadcaster just letting the upset settle, they sent a firm message. They sent Cherry packing. Then only days later, Calgary Flames went on to face the Buffalo Sabres without coach Bill Peters. His rule was in question after allegations that he used racial slurs against a player while he was coaching in minor hockey. The Flames were fanned, no pun intended, when another player recently came forward, telling of Peters using physical violence during his time with the Carolina Hurricanes. He alleges that Bill would kick and punch his players. Coach Peters' future with the Flames ended Friday morning, November 29th, when he resigned. That same day, Keefe was quoted in the Toronto Star saying, It's pretty clear here in our organization, we've made it a priority to treat players with respect, to have a culture of respect and positivity. And that's very important to everything that we're doing here. And I think hockey in general is taking a big swing in that direction over the last number of years. It's no longer a question that players from the old regime are the ones leading their way in the minors and NHL. And it's encouraging to see the Dantons and the Keefs refusing to continue the culture of bullying and abuse, instead focusing on working skills and communication to motivate players. The future looks positive for North American hockey, I suppose, but not too far behind us are all of the players and their families that are still struggling with what I call the David Frost syndrome. Abiding by the old adage of what you hear here, what you see here. When you leave here, let it stay here, is for AA meetings, not hockey rinks. All of the stress, anxiety, sweat, anger, sexual abuse, physical abuse, hazing, divided families, trials, jail time. It's hard to believe that it was all over a game. David Frost has moved on, working for a time at a hockey academy in Laguna Beach, where he used his wife's last name in an attempt to distance himself from his reputation. And it didn't take long for someone to question him, and he had to move on. Now, he's traveling around as he acquires consulting service contracts, because a shark has to keep moving, and with no criminal record, there are no boundaries for him to observe. So, in a way, nothing has really changed for Old Frosty. Thank you so much for coming on this two-part journey with me about David Frost and Mike Danton. I don't know about you, but the case of attempted murder for hire really was not what it appeared in the beginning. So you've come on a long voyage with me on this one. If you find the story interesting and you want to know more, I highly recommend that you check out Steve Simmons' book. The link is in the notes. Well, it looks like Astrid's time for dinner, so I want to leave you with this. In terms of hockey like any other sport. David Frost had it all wrong. He lost sight of the one element that makes hockey great, and that's the fans. Oh, Leafs win! Ah! Three to one over the Arizona Coyotes! Chief Keefe, Sheldon Keefe, his first win as an NHL coach! Tyson Berry, his first goal as a Leaf! Pierre Engvall, his first goal! Austin Matthews scoring in his one opportunity to score in Arizona. Who is not jacked this morning? I have waited a long time for this because we've had some bad days recently. But in case you can't tell this morning, oh, the coffee is good.